my message today is get out of the way. Do you surrender all? It sort of ties in with Ron's this morning a little bit. Some of the things you said made me think of the message. And, and then when we got in there, you know, do we really surrender all? It's an easy talking point. It's an easy thing that we say that we do. But when it gets down to it, do we really surrender all to Christ? What about your life? Do you really surrender your life? Your kids. You know, I, I can remember when my kids were young, I prayed for them often. But then when they got to be teenage years, when they really needed it, I still prayed for them. But my attitude changed and, and my attitude changed because of me, not because God. But my attitude changed because I had it all together. You know, I was a self-made man. I had it all together. Well, in essence, I wasn't. I was still a, I was a bigger failure than I was beforehand. And, and so I, I, I let my guard down. Do you know what God's will is for your life? You know... Uh, we've all been in places in our life where we've walked real close to God. And then all at once, we just sort of backed off a little bit. And when we backed off, we started playing the game of church. Now, if I'm just preaching to me, it's okay, because I've been there. I've done it over and over and over in my life. Things get going real good, and you forget what puts you where you're at. And you start slipping. You start depending on self rather than depending on God. And it's easy. It's like the devil just slips in that back door and before you know it, he's got control. So, do you surrender all? Do you give it all to God? My point today is, is we need to learn how to give our whole life to God. Not just this small little corner. You know, they say that if you look at a person's checkbook, you know if they're giving it all to God. Okay? But that wouldn't have worked for me way back when because I learned early in life that you not only tithe, but you give an offering. And, and so that was always at the top of my list. It didn't matter if I had money in the bank or not. God got his first. My check, when I got my paycheck, God got his first. So that wouldn't have worked in my life. But a lot of times that's a starting point. Because there were other things that I was doing that were crazy that were out of control. Let's pray. God, as I do the message today, the last part of Romans 15, Father, I ask that you help me to deliver it in the way that I understand it, to make it clear and understanding. Father, we all, at some point in our Christian life, play games. We all say that we trust God with everything, but in our closet we hold things back. Father, it's my desire to not just talk about trusting, but do it. I pray that it's this congregation's prayer also. For it's in your son's name. Amen. When I got to Romans 15, verse 20, next slide, I started thinking about my, my title, my, my first paragraph, or whatever you call those things when you make outlines, was, it's not about me, it's about God. And what happens in life is, is we make so much life about us calling it God that we forget that God is who put us where we're at. 
But he also, God, because of free will, he allows us to make mistakes. My very first little comment here was, have you ever played church? Think about it. Have you played church? You get up and go to church on Sunday morning. You get up and go Sunday night. You get up and go Wednesday night. Or don't get up and go. You go Wednesday night. You go. Every time, every time there's a church function, you go. Every time there's a visitation that needs to be made, you go. But are you doing it for God or are you doing it for yourself? Or are you doing it because if you don't go, the preacher's going to call you? Think about it. Do we play church? And, and I'm going to tell you again, I did. I've done it over and over. I got good at it. I got good at it because I could go to church. I could be the best, the best person in the church. I could do more work in the church than anybody else was doing. But I was going to work on Monday morning and forgetting about who God was. Do we play church? Maybe I'm the only one guilty. One thing I used to say, and I, I said it more times than, than not when I was in Georgia, when I was going to church in Georgia. I was a deacon. And I, I think about this a lot, how ridiculous I was. One thing I used to say when I was playing, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. You heard that before? I, want to be, I, I, want to be, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. And I, and I always illustrated it to a, a pastor friend that could not carry on a conversation with anybody about nothing unless it was the Bible. That's so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. But on the other hand, you need to be that heavenly minded. You need to be heavenly minded where people draw you draw people to God through your life. You know, why do you not get upset when things happen, when things go wrong? How can you always have joy in your life? How can you always have this? It's because you're heavenly minded. Okay? And if you can use those joys in your life, those things in your life that God has blessed you with, you become earthly good. But if you have the attitude that I've got to keep it separate, it's not separate. It's all or none when it comes to our Christian walk. The, verse, the first verse, And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would build on another man's foundation, but as it was written, they who, have ha who had no news of him shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Aspired to preach. Even when I wasn't a preacher, and, and I'm saying this, I'm, I'm using me as an illustration, trying to get you to think about yourself, your own life, because I don't want to point fingers at you. But even when I was a Christian, I'm supposed to witness, I'm supposed to share, I'm supposed to help, but did I? Or did I play the game? What about, what do you think about uh, God in your will? What's His will in your life? His will in your life is to aspire to honor Him in everything that we say and do. When it got down to the end, it says, not where Christ was already named. This was Paul preaching. And Paul had made the decision, and Paul was my hero, okay? Paul is my hero in the gospel, okay? But Paul was saying, not where it had already been preached. He didn't want to follow somebody else. 
He didn't want to go in and follow someone else in this passage. He did want to follow Jesus. But in some regards, that was an arrogant statement. Because he had made the decision in his own heart that what he was going to do was what was important, and he wasn't listening to what God had for him. And God has a habit, if you're following Him, if you're walking with Him, if you're trusting Him, He has a habit of changing your plans. Right? He's changed mine a bunch of times. Paul wanted, <coughs> Paul wanted more or less not to follow. But we are called to build upon God's Word. Everyone cannot be an evangelist. God uses pastors and teachers to expand and grow the kingdom. Everybody can't be a Billy Graham. Okay? I can never be a Billy Graham. I can't be a Franklin Graham. I can't be a Robert Jeffers. I can't be an Adrian Rogers. There's so many of them that, that I can say I'd I aspire to. Is that the right word? That I would love to have the same ministry as they do. But I can, I'm not called to that. Our church may never reach 50. But if God put me here, that's where He wants me to be. I learned, I heard a message 44 years ago. Probably nobody in here knows who He is. His name was Lester Roloff. And Lester Roloff said that if God puts you somewhere, you stay until God takes you out. You don't chase the big church. You don't chase the big salary. You don't chase anything else. You go where God puts you to, and then you do everything God has you do until He moves you. Today's society, we chase that paycheck. We ch not everybody. I'm not going to say everybody, but so many of today's ministers, they chase that paycheck. The, the last part of that, uh, Christ was already named, so I would build another man's foundation. But then the last part, as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. That was actually a quote from Isaiah 52.15. And it's primarily, sort of like Ron said this morning, it was referring to the second coming, but it, it inter intermingled with an application for today. And the application was, was for evangelism, pastors, and teachers. We need to evangelize the world, okay? But it's not my job to be an evangelist. It's my job to be a pastor teacher. It's my job to love people. It's your job to be teachers, to love people. And until we can get that concept in our mind that we have to love everybody regardless of what they look like, what they smell like, what lifestyle they live, we have to love them. Romans 10, 14 said, How will they call on him whom they've not heard uh, and, have not, and have, not, have not believed? How will they believe whom they have not heard, and how will they believe without a preacher? And I added, a teacher, a Christian. How will they understand, how will they ever know anything unless somebody tells them? Now, I know the verse, if you don't praise my name, the rocks and hills will cry out. Now, that's not a, that's a loose interpretation of that verse. But, God puts us here as believers to tell others, non-believers, and believers who are struggling. That's what God put us here on earth for. Next slide. Our, plan, our plans are not always... I should have left out two God's plans. Our plans are not always God's plans. Our plans... The plans that we have for life are not always God's plans. I've told y'all before, my plans as a young adult 
was to be a show off. To be a success and be able to go back to my high school reunion and say, look what I did. God changed my plans. Now, I've been a success. Not to maybe to the degree of some of my friends. I've got a high school friend that has been on a boat, ocean liner boat, that she owns for the last 15 years. Okay? Think about it. Think of the money. That's a success by earthly standards. Well, she is a Christian too, but you know that's a success by earthly standards. She travels the world. But that's not where God put me. God put me in Gainesboro, Tennessee to work, to do, and to minister. For this reason, I have often been prevented from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have not had for many years a longing to come to you whenever to go to, when I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to, and to be helped on my way there by you when, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. What he was saying, what, what I'm saying, what I believe the passage is saying, have you ever got ahead of God? Have you ever lived your life in a way that, that you're serving God, that you're going to church, that you're doing all the things that you think God has called you to do, but all at once, you get ahead of Him. You, you, you get this idea in your head, and it's probably a good, godly idea, but, you know, sometimes God tells us to wait. But I'm gung-ho. I don't know how to wait. I don't know how to sit back and relax. I don't know how to just sit in my easy chair, and now I do, but used to not. Sit in my easy chair, and if I get an idea, whether it's God's idea or whether it was a work idea, I went at it gung-ho, full force to change the world. Sometimes we get ahead of God. Sometimes God wants us to wait. And because we have free will, He lets us get out there. Because what happens when you get ahead of God? It's a flop. It's a mistake. It's a mess up. Now, sometimes He honors them. But if you had waited on God, what a blessing it could have been. But a man... You're a woman. Sometimes we get ahead of God. The word prevented in that first verse, been prevented from coming to you. Paul was prevented because he wanted his will, not God's will. Paul's desire was to go to a certain place. Paul's desire was to skip certain regions and go somewhere else. But God prevented him from going. He had the right heart. What was he going for? To lead people to Christ. Why was he going? To change the world. But he wasn't going in God's time frame. If you read Acts 16, 7, it talks about that. It said that he had the right heart but uh, not the right ear. He, had his, he wasn't listening to God. No further place was the next little block I took. God stopped him with no other place for me in these regions. God stopped him. He said, I got to go somewhere. There's no place for me to go, so I'm going to go where I want to go. Paul had made up his mind. Planning doesn't mean that you lack, of, lack trust of God, but plans must always be in God's plan. Paul had to be in line 
Paul had to be in the line of God's plan. Proverbs 16, 9, 10, 16, 9 says, the, man, or the mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We need to think about it. When, when we make decisions, when we decide to go somewhere, when we decide to do something, when we have these grandiose plans of what's going to happen in our life, in our church, or wherever we're at, we need to make sure that those plans are consistent with, consistent with God's will, not consistent with our will. Because there is a difference. I believe God gives us plans, but He always answers prayers. I've said that many times. Yes, no, what's the biggest one? Wait. Wait on God. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings of eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. I think that's the next verse I had written down. The next, next little phrase in here says, I'm longing to come to you. Paul was talking that he was longing to go to a certain place. Later in the passage, it talks about Spain. Now, I had to look Spain up because I didn't think Spain was in the Old Testament, but it is. He's longing to go to Spain. That's where Paul has decided, well, how did I start this verse out? He didn't want to go where somebody else had already been. I don't want to go there because somebody else has been there. Who was there? Jesus. I don't want to go there. I want to go where I want to go. I feel like these people need to be changed. So I'm going to go where I want to go. God, you just got to, you just got to meet me halfway. Because I'm going. Do we get that way sometimes? Paul had put off, and this was all the way back in, 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 at, or in Romans 10, or 1, verses 10 through 13. I'm sorry, in Acts. This was in Acts 1, where he had planned to go then. And God just kept putting it off, putting it off, and putting it off. Spain, this ain't Spain we know. Spain was a far west European continent where commerce and well traveled and it was part and not too far from Rome Romans road the Romans road not the Romans road in the bible but Romans commerce part it was a place to be it was the place it was the mark it was the place that everybody wanted to go to. It's like sort of like New York City. Of course, not anymore, not this week. Sort of like New York City. Everybody wants to go to New York one time in their life. Everybody wants to go here. Not you, Ashley, I know. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to go until I went, okay? I wouldn't have gone if it wasn't such a good deal on the trip. <laughs> but... You know, one place that I want to go back to or go to that I've never been is the, no, I've been to Washington. I want to go to the Swiss apps. Why do I want to go? When Deb and I, no, when Deb and I flew to Greece, we flew over the Swiss apps. It was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen in my life. I want to go. Hmm? Alps, okay, A-L-P-S. Okay. You're here to educate me, Bill. I'm fine with that. You know, but Spain was the place to go. He was going because that was the place that he could receive recognition. The next part of that verse says, helped on my way. Uh, and be helped on my, helped on my way there. In other words, I'm going there, but I'm a missionary, so you got to help me get there. Again, not following God's plan. I shouldn't say plan, God's timing. He wasn't following God's timing. Paul was hoping the Church of Rome would fund him and escort him to 
Spain. Do we sometimes get out of the will of God? Do we sometimes do things that, I don't want to say out of the will, but get ahead of? Do we do it? Do we do it sometimes over and over and over and wonder why God's not blessing us? Wonder why God's not prospering us? Wonder why we've always got these internal battles going on in our life? It's because we're not waiting on the Lord. We're getting ahead of the Lord. Sometimes it happens, even to the best of us. Next slide. Plans are subject to God's plan. And God always provides. You know, I used to have on my mirror at home, and I had it in my car, and I had it in my, my day timer. I, I've always carried a day timer. I had it where God guides, He provides. But there's a second part of that. If we trust and obey. That used to be something I would say every day. And, and then, I, I, even though I said it, it was if I work hard, if I do this, if I do this, and I go to church on Sunday. Hmm? I know. But, but what I'm saying is, is it's so easy that when God starts blessing you, and you're blessed, and you're blessed, and you're blessed, to fall off that mountain. To fall off of what God is doing for you in your life. And He lets you. We mess up. But He, he makes a way for us to get back up there. But now, this is Paul. I'm, remember, I'm going to Spain. That's where I'm going. But now, I'm going to Jerusalem. Serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make contribution for the, uh, the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. In other words, I'm going to Spain, but God has provided a way for me to go to Jerusalem. He's provided that, so it's, it's God's will for that's where I'm supposed to be. God is making a way for me to be there. And I need to follow God in that plan. In other words, uh, Spain is now put on the back burner. We've all been there. Serving God, serving God changed Paul's plans. The Jerusalem church was still struggling. Now, it's real easy. If God redirects your path and you do like Jonah did, remember Jonah and the well? What happened? God told him to go somewhere. He chose not to go and he ended up in the belly of a well. And then he got spit up on the ground and where did he go as soon as he got through? Was it Nineveh? It was Nineveh? Why? God told him to go to Nineveh. But, God, I know better than you. Nineveh is a crazy place. Nineveh, those people don't want me there. But if God sends you, he's going to protect you. Those people don't want me there. I'll just go this way. And what happened? God has a way of putting you back in his path. Macedonia and a Acacia, I can't say that. Paul had been there before. He went there actually in his first and second missionary journey. And they were happy to contribute to his going to Jerusalem to do the work for Jerusalem. And it says the next thing, he says they were pleased to do so because of the message, because the message must go out. We are happy and blessed to share what God has given us corporately, it's easy. It's easy for us corporately 
to support the missionaries we do. Lighthouse Christian Camp. The scooter that we bought this year. Cookville Pregnancy Clinic. Howard. It's easy for us to do that corporately. And I know some of you do it individually on a smaller scale. And that's become easy for you. But God expects us to not only do it corporately, but to do it individually. God expects us as we trust Him and as He blesses us to meet the needs of others, other groups, individuals. I know some of you, okay? If I say we need so-and-so, you jump right on it, okay? Every time. And it doesn't matter, and I'll even say this, sometimes I'm amazed at the money some of you do to meet the needs of somebody when the need goes out there. But then on the other side of it, there are people that say, well, I just don't have enough money to take care of myself. I can't do that. Well, why do you think you don't have enough money? God tells us to honor Him with our first fruits. And He'll meet our needs. And I'll, I'll challenge you. This isn't a money message. This isn't a tithing message. This isn't nothing. But I can do more with 50% of what I got than you can do with 100% as long as I'm trusting God with every dime I got. And I used to say 90%. But I can do more with 50% as long as I'm trusting God. The spiritual things down in the last part of Gentiles have shared in spiritual things. They're indebted to minister to them. The spiritual things were the, the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. Macedonia and Archaea were Gentiles. What were the Gentiles doing? They were meeting the needs of the Jews of Jerusalem to bring them to a stronger faith. It's the same thing that we're called to do. When we support Lighthouse Christian Camp, it's meeting the needs of kids that aren't in church. When we support Cookville Pregnancy Clinic, do you know that 50 to 60% of the girls that go in there that are pregnant are unchristian, not saved? Maybe even higher than that. You know the first thing that they do after they do a pregnancy test? They ask to them about their salvation. They ask them. I don't want no part of that. Okay. Come back next week. You're pregnant. You've got this, this. We'll take care of your exams. We'll take care of this stuff. Next week. We love you. Have I told you about Jesus? And over and over and over. Then when the, the baby's born or the, about the time for the baby's born, they got this little program called Baby Bucks. And they start giving away formula and diapers and clothes and bed uh, bassinets. Changing towels, is that what they're called? Changing tables. We use diapers. <laughs> we use diapers. But they give them pampers. They give them all that. You know, if you show person, a person enough love, they don't, we don't just give it to them. They don't just give it to them. They have to do what's called earning baby bucks. You know what baby bucks is? It's scripture. It's scripture. It's scripture. It's, it's talking about raising babies. It's talking about all these things. Eventually, 80% maybe come to know the Lord. 90% come to know the Lord. Why? We have a part in that. Because we've done it as a congregation and we've done it individually. I know some of you that, that have gone to the, the uh, 
banquets with us. And, and you always fill out that envelope. Sometimes it's just prayer, but you know what? Prayer is important too. Finish this, help them grow. They were helping them grow. The Gentiles were helping the Jews grow. The fruit was the financial gift for Jerusalem Ministry Church. Gentiles were taking care of the Jews. Now, I don't know if we know it or not. Ron, I hope it's okay. I'm not going to apologize. When Wayne died, Wayne Wells died, the one thing that he asked for in his obituary was that all donations not go to him, not go to the family, don't buy me flowers, don't do all that. He says, I want one thing done. And that one thing that was done was a contribution made to the children's program of Gainsborough Church of Christ. Boy, did we cross the denominational line. But we made a contribution to Gainsborough Church of Christ Children's Ministry. Why was that important? Because they struggle just like we do with children. And they are out there trying to change the lives of children to reach adults. Crystal, y'all don't know Crystal, but Crystal comes to our house to help Deb, to help Mom. She cleans, she watches Mom, she does all this stuff. Crystal is a product of Gainsborough Church of Christ Children's Ministry. She's on drugs. Her husband was on drugs. They had all this stuff going on in their life. Because Gainsborough Church Christ sent a van out, and I still want a van, sent a van out to pick up these kids in the projects, that whole family's been changed. Because they had a vision. Because others, you know what started that program? I'll even back up from that. You know what started that program? College Side Church Christ had a young couples class that said, what can we do to minister? So every Wednesday night, a group from College Side, instead of going to College Side Church Christ, they come to Gainesboro Church Christ and run the children's program. Why? Because they got all old people in that church, just like us. Think about it. We are to give out of our abundance, not out of our abundance. We're to give out of our first fruits to meet the needs. The abundance will come afterwards. And then it's the last part of that verse. He mentions Spain again. The very last thing, the very last word in that verse, those verses, verse 28, he mentions Spain again. I'm still trying to get there. In other words, he's going, you're going to support me to go. Okay? I, didn't, I didn't catch that, but that's what he's saying. You're going to support me to go. You're going to support me. And I'm still going to Spain. Well, he's going to go. But it's got to be in God's timing, not his. I know God's timetable, God's timetable brings blessings. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of blessings of Christ. <laughs> hey, I'm still wanting to go to Spain. It's, it's what I've been waiting on. It's what I've planned. And I don't know how long. I don't know if it was a year, two years, or if it was six months. I don't know that. The Bible is not clear in that category. I even tried to look up this morning when I was reviewing all this, how long had he been where he was at. And I couldn't, the best I could figure was three years to four years. Not where he wanted to be. Not where he wanted to be. Sometimes God keeps us in a place to draw us closer to him. But I got to get out of here. God took me to the God forsaken city of Atlanta, Georgia. 
I lived there for nine years. I hated all nine years of it. I couldn't wait to move. But he kept me there for nine years. Guess what? I grew a whole lot in Atlanta, Georgia. Not because I want to, but because God put me there and wouldn't let me leave. I even made the statement in the church that I came out of when I went to Atlanta that I'll be back in three years. I'm not staying longer than three years. I'll be back. Well, guess what? He changed my plan. And then when I moved to Cookville, they said, why are you driving to Nashville every day and living in Cookville? Because this is where God put me. I wouldn't be here if I'd gone to Nashville. But God had the big picture in mind. I had the little bitty picture in mind. I know that when I come to you, I come in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. When I get there, God's going to bless me. When I follow God's plan, He's going to bless it. He's going to honor it. Not that I haven't had some blessings along the, light, light, along the way, but when I get to where He wants me to be, He's going to really honor it. My long away trip. But when I make it in God's timing, it's easy to say, isn't it? When I get there, but sometimes it's hard to do. It's hard to wait on God. It's hard to wait until He says it's time. Kevin, you've battled with that a lot. We've talked about it a whole lot. And not to pick on you, but you know what I'm saying. It's hard to wait on God. Knowing that He's got the best plan. He, he's got the best plan. But nobody wants to wait. I want it and I want it now. You know, we're, what, why do we use credit cards? Instant gratification. We buy things that we don't need to impress people we don't like to prove to them that we're in good shape. We do it. But when I make it, Faithfulness of blessings of Christ. Isaiah 40, 31 says, Yet those, this is where I said that earlier, Yet those that wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings of eagles. They will run and not get tired. King James says get weary. They will walk and not become weary. King James says faint. I like faint better, but since we're doing New American Standard, I had to put it that way. If you wait on God, not only will He meet your needs, He'll give you strength before He meets them. And then you'll soar like an eagle. And you won't have those drawbacks. Five, pray for me and God's will for me. That's not just, that's just not what Paul said, but it's what I say. It's what I say to you that you should say. We should pray for God's will in our life. It might take us down a rough road. It might put us in situations that, that we say, I can't believe this is happening. But you know every situation in your life, good or bad, God uses it for His glory. But we know all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. You too. I think of y'all a lot. The life that y'all had as kids and the life you have today, God uses those situations to help you today. He uses them over and over and over. But we've got to trust Him. 
Now I urge you, brethren, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers. Pray. Pray for me as I pray for you. Pray for our country. Pray for our president. Pray for Nancy Pelosi. And, and that, that guy, <laughs> huh? No, that guy in Virginia. Pray for him. That God, I almost said something ugly. Pray for him. Prayer changes things. But, but what do we do? We sit back and just coast along and let things, everything, everything be good. It's not affecting me, so what does it matter? In the long run, it's affecting you. In the long run, God forbid. But many of us have grandchildren. What if our grand... Pray for your grandchildren. What if your grandchild is faced with the Virginia law or the thing that's going into law? What if they're faced with it? It's your fault if you hadn't prayed. Pray for them. Love and Spirit. Paul's love for the Spirit, not the Spirit's love for himself. Not the love not God's love for you but your love for God that's a stopping point God's love is never ending God's love is forgiving how much do we love God it shows up in everything that we do and say do you really love God with everything going on, I believe we'll, we're going to be tested like we never have before. I believe things that are going on in our country today are the stepping stones. And we, we talk, you know, all my life, God's coming back, God's coming back, God's coming back. I believe it. I believe we're closer than we ever were before. But that's not saying tomorrow. That's saying today is closer than it was yesterday. Okay? We're close. God is coming back. And He's going to judge, not us, because we've got the blood of Jesus. But we still have to face the judgment seat. And, and the facing the judgment seat, Rod didn't say it this morning, but facing the judgment seat, I believe, is the wheat from the chaff. That, that, that some of the people that profess don't possess. And they will be judged. Just because you go to church, just because you profess, doesn't mean that you got it. And the judgment seat's real. Uh, Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? No matter what you believe about the end times, because there's different opinions, everybody's got a different idea when it's going to be, persecution has started. Will you stand for Christ? Are you going to stand up for what's right? Are you going to stand up for God? If they come like the end times talk about, the mark of the beast and all that stuff, if that happens, are you going to take the mark just so you can have food? Or are you going to trust God? It's a big question. What about your kids? God, I've got to take care of my kids. If you trust him, he'll take care of you. If you don't trust him, where are you going to be? Strive together in prayer. We are never more united than when we pray. We've had a lot of prayer here in the last few weeks. Our church is united. Our congregation. I get messages praying for you, Pastor. I send messages out. I'm praying for you. That's important that we pray for each other. Down at the very last of that, it says rescued. Rescued from the disobedient in Judea. Disobedient. Look at our world. This was talking about biblical times. 
I'm talking today. Look at our world. Abortion. LGBT, did I say that right? I always get the the message. I wrote it down one way, then I changed it. Drag queens. Our leaders. I'll even say our church leaders sometimes. The world. The non-Christian people that call themselves Christians that are playing the world. Our lack of faithfulness. What's wrong is right. And what's right is wrong in today's society. And my phrase that I always say, the Americanized Christian. We're a bunch of Americanized Christians. We don't have any standards anymore. Now, I'm thankful that we do here for the most part. But as the world, there's no standards. One of my pet peeves, everybody, and I've said it before. What's going on today, tonight? Super Bowl. How many churches will cancel service tonight? A bunch. There's already on the internet, already on Facebook. How many will have a Super Bowl party tonight? Where they bring in the beer commercials, the, the neck and cheerleaders, all that stuff. Okay? They bring it into the sanctuary of the church to glorify God. Now, granted, they'll have some good speakers there. Tim Tebow will go to one of them. Okay? But when you bring the world into the church, whether it's the Super Bowl or it's the music or whatever, I, I told you all a couple of weeks ago about that Christian group that, excuse me, but that Christian group that has the word hell, living in hell, in their song. I'm living in hell. And it's a Christian group. That is not what, that's, that's not being separate from the world. That's bringing the world into the church. And we have to be strong when it comes to that. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. God will be with you. He is with you. We walk away. He never does. God's never walked away from me. But I can't count the times that I've walked away from Him. And I bet you can say you're in the same boat. Hebrews 13.5 says, I will never leave you or desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Now, there's a lot more of that verse than I realized. But the that portion is uh, Hebrews 13, 5. Just as He is the God of our hope, He is the only source of true peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, understanding. I, I learned it, understanding. <laughs> Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you trust Him totally, you'll have peace. No matter what comes your way, you'll have peace. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 14, and I just wrote down uh, 13 and 14, and then I wrote down parts of 15 and 16. But now in Christ Jesus you were formerly far off and have been brought near to the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups in him one and broke down the barrier, the dividing wall. What groups was he talking about? The Jew and the Gentile. They became one in Christ. Make two into one new man, thus establish peace. And then part, that was part of verse 15 and 16 says, might reconcile them both in one body through the cross. When we trust God totally, when we depend on Him totally, when we give it all to Him, we have peace. When God is the center focus of our life, 
we have peace, we have comfort. We got all the blessings that he gives us. But step back one foot, two foot. Because that one foot does this. And it, it, it's smooth for a little while. And you step back another one. Still a little bit smooth. Before you know it, you're all the way back here. All the way out of God's will. And then it's turmoil. And God's still there saying, go back home. Come to me. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Who walked away? We did. 